Thank you, Barb. Um, and thank you to the organizers of this conference for having me. I um, will talk about um, my work to some degree. So we'll start to talk about uh, TRD, treatment-resistant depression. And we heard uh, a beautiful talk this morning um, by Dr. Duval. And uh, so I'm glad that you have some preparation now <laughs> for this. And then we'll spend um, more time on the interprofessional piece of this presentation. And I, I have to say, I didn't realize until just about, you know, middle of the morning how appropriate uh, this is at a conference like this that attracts across different professions where we have sort of a truly uh, mixed disciplines audience and, and presenters, which you know, we've seen have all their different approaches to dealing with some of the same disorders and presentations. And so this effort is really in hopes of having a more effective collaboration among us. Whether this is across the world, that's usually the easy part, but across disciplines is, at least in my experience, the harder part. So the people next door who have a different background. <laughs> um, so I have no financial disclosures, and I have to now kind of move things. Um, here, so our agenda for today is going to be, I thought there was like a, yeah, this slide, um, is going to be to talk first about TRD definition scope, and then I will very quickly summarize or go through some intervention, uh, individual interventions that we use for a uh, treatment-resistant depression, and then I will talk about um, sort of the ideal way to have interprofessional team-based care, and then bring some more realistic examples and where current barriers exist, and hopefully come to uh, talk a little bit about solutions as well. So let's start with uh, TRD. As uh, many of you probably know, it's defined. Um, in the U.S., these are uh, definitions from both Europe and from the U.S., <clears throat> and it's always a form of major depressive disorder that has not benefited from at least two adequate trials of antidepressant compounds of different mechanisms of action. So really, we're talking about drug-resistant or drug difficult to treat with drugs depression. Lots of discussions about uh, the name of even that beast. But the important piece is that, um, as uh, Dr. Duval this morning also said, most of the people that we see in TRD clinics, because it's a tertiary clinic where we get sort of the, you know, the, the people that have failed in other settings, uh, these people, by definition, have, to had, have had two trials of adequate dose and duration of these medications to different classes and usually have had a whole lot more. So the typical patient we see has 20 to 30 failed trials of antidepressants, has usually tried at least one or two evidence-based psychotherapies, and um, is at this point quite desperate. So I will um, just quickly say that I think we all appreciate the significance uh, of uh, depression, major depressive disorder at large. Well, as many of you may also know, 50% diagnosed with MDD do not rem um, reach remission after the first treatment trial, and more than 30% fail after multiple treatment trials. So it's, you know, two is the minimum, but most of um, the people with treatment-resistant resi uh, treatment depression have um, not benefited from many different uh, trials of intervention. So um, this beast is characterized by a history of these failed treatments, longer history. Most of my patients are in their 50s, 60s, 70s, some younger. Um, and that's a whole different story. Depression tends to be severe, although it doesn't always meet criteria for severe major depression, a higher rate of suicidality, more anhedonia, um, learned helplessness and hopelessness. So I will say um, I am a, my primary clinical uh, work is as a cognitive behavior psych, uh, therapist. 
And in the behavioral language, we would say these, uh, these clients uh, with chronic depression have often reported childhood histories of, well, really abuse, neglect, um, often meet for PTSD and have had prolonged and inescapable kind of punishment settings. So they um, didn't develop some of the healthy behaviors and this punishment of healthy behaviors is still sort of influencing them in their everyday life. So this is something that I think from a behavioral perspective is very important for us to take into account because us trying to activate them and doing things that for most of us sound like joyful activities uh, is often associated with a complicated um, expected response for this population. So they have often become chronically passive and even unwilling to try. Um, and this is an important feature of TRD because I think it's really treatment interfering, as we say, and it, it can undermine a lot of our efforts, whether this is coming from social work, psychology, psychiatry, or other disciplines. Um, so with that, we will move on to individual treatments for TRD, and obviously I will not go into the detail of, um, of all the treatments out there for depression, but um, just to sort of name the main categories, um, we have of course uh, the medication trials. Uh, we have, wait, there's a slide missing, I believe. Okay, slide is not in here. Uh, we have psychotherapy, we have other psychosocial interventions and in care uh, coordination. And nowadays, um, a lot of neuromodulation. I work in a group that is specializing in neuromodulation. Um, I'll get to this in a minute. I will say that um, in the US where I practice, uh, we have definitions, we have clinical guidelines uh, that came out from the American Psychiatric Association and from the American Psychological Association with great, greatly overlapping guidelines for treating depression with the exception that um, the Psychological Association talks about empirically supported psychotherapy as a first line of treatment for all depressions. And um, I will get to what empirically uh, supported psychotherapy means in a minute. And then as uh, first line treatment, second generation antidepressant meds, and or the combination of an evidence-based uh, psychological interventions plus pharmacotherapy. And the APA really talks about, the Psychiatric Association talks about really the antidepressants being the first line of treatment for moderate and severe depression. For severe depression, it's a ECT. And then depression-focused psychotherapy alone is recommended as initial treatment of choice for mild to moderate MDDs. So for those of you who research depression treatment, this might sound a little outdated, and it is, <laughs> because um, our APA guidelines are always like 10 to 15 years behind. This is still sort of the WHO guidelines as well, but our research has now, um, I think, given more credence to psychotherapy, which is in Europe tends to be more front and center anyway. Um, the US is kind of catching up with that, and there's a lot of, um, you know, new interventions that are coming out. Um, the main reason for today's talk is that uh, it really is not the standard of care anymore to choose one, but for the beast that has already failed many monotherapies of any of these kinds, we tend to combine um, different interventions. So this is a quick and dirty overview over the pharmacotherapy that we see for depression at large, but also in our TRD clinic. Um, obviously, lots of different combinations. Uh, and then there are categories that are not even up here, like um, receptor modulator medications and others. Uh, most often, what we see in our clinic is to see if people have tried tricyclics or MIOI inhibitors yet. And they often have, and then we go straight to neuromodulation and um, include <laughs> some of the um, newly added forms of pharmacotherapy. And um, so actually, who knows what this is? Mushroom. Definitely, it's the psilocybe mushroom. 
And I'm actually curious to hear where Europe and different countries are with this, but it is becoming very popular in the US. And of course, research is just starting. So um, I'm going to skip the slide on different psychedelics um, because you just skipped out of that <laughs> by saying mushroom. <laughs> um, I, I think that there's a lot of interesting um, things we could talk about, these different interventions. Uh, but I got to tell you, as somebody who works in a, in a clinic for highly severely disabled and, and suicidal uh, depressed patients, it, it is really a mixed bag that we have this. It's, it's great that we are doing research on it, but our patients are often ahead of the curve. So a lot of people are microdosing. A lot of people are stopping their medications because they read that it interferes with the microdosing of either the, the psilocybin or the uh, ketamine treatment. And ketamine clinics are also popping up, not regulated by psychiatry. And so a lot of people are choosing these things before the research is really out. And they often stop their meds. And I have seen more than one patient end up in the hospital and coming back to the clinic, starting kind of from scratch again. So um, and by the way, feel free to ask questions as we go. If you, Yeah, go ahead. Um, this may be a little bit out of the but for your sake. But I was just wondering, if you see an artist uh, um, in people who do take psychedelics and increase in this behavior, are they increasing risk behaviors? So again, the problem is that those people we don't catch with research necessarily, but um, not necessarily. So the ketamine treatment, for example, has been shown to reduce suicidality very quickly. And so if you consider that a risk behavior, I would say no. And um, I, I don't think I can speak to the psilocybin um, in terms of um, increasing risk behavior. The research isn't shown that, but in the research studies, it's a very controlled setting with this very specific dosing and very good supervision. And as I'll say in a couple of slides, usually accompanied by psychotherapy and a lot of people watching what's happening. And so, no, we have not seen increase in risk behaviors in these few data that are coming out here and there. Uh, but if you're looking at other impulse control issues, I'm not sure that that's too early for me to say at least. <laughs> Question. So okay. I noticed that ketamine has been becoming like a, a phrase or, or a popular. I didn't realize that it was actually a drug that was recognized by KPA or ASA. So I'm wondering, because I believe there was recently a death from a ketamine overdose, and I wasn't sure, but uh, the actor, yeah, Matthew, Matthew yeah, he... Mm -hmm. Allegedly overdosed off of ketamine, but it, was it because he was mixing it with like other stuff? Like that needs to be taken solo and not like still drinking, still smoking, and all that. So it's a very good question. Um, I don't know exactly what Matthew Perry did, <laughs> but I don't know you, uh, you because I read it. Oh, you do? Yeah, because I, I was, so a was a fan of him. Yeah. yeah, fan of him until I read his biography. Uh, <laughs> no, the thing is that I'm glad you're here. <laughs> yeah. No, the thing is that he. He didn't die from ketamine. Oh, okay. The problem is that he was in the hot, in the top, and as the ketamine is, well, is, uh, is anesthesia, basically, oh. then he died yeah. drawn because he just was falling, you know, like, and, oh. yeah. and then you don't react. So you are like, you kind of, you know, with the breathe. water, you kind of yeah. breathe because yeah. the water is getting into you. And you just don't react. Yeah. Oh, see, that's the misinformation that's going out because ketamine is supposedly the drug that makes you like happy. No, no. no. Well, it's an anesthetic, yeah. okay. but okay. it can act as a hallucinogen in a small dose. So it can induce, I don't know, happy, I wouldn't quite use that word, but it can, it's mind altering and it, mm. it uh, creates a state that a lot of people associate with like, opening their mind and having almost some existential moment. A lot of them see it as positive. And there's this, there's a lot of research that looks at one dose, one time intervention, and it can have an antidepressant effect because of this mind altering kind of life changing experience that people can have. Now you can have a bad trip too, mm -hmm. right? It's 
special K or whatever it's called in Europe. <laughs> so the drug has been around for a long time and it's used in medicine for as an anesthetic, but uh, it's a much smaller dose as an antidepressant and it, it can have negative side effects, but it usually induces just mind altering. And if you think of somebody stuck in depression, that's usually a good thing. It's a different experience and that is often what sort of breaks the cycle that we talked about this morning of having sort of the idea that there's something else out there, that this doesn't have to be my life, and that can do that, right? And so that's very powerful in this way. However, I don't, it's not something that people are supposed to microdose on their own, but we've seen this, and so they are definitely, if you just Google it, right, there's a lot of evidence or there's a lot of information out there and some is misinformation that the, the treat the, the, some of the antidepressants you take could limit the effect of ketamine and so then people get this idea that they should stop their antidepressants. That is not necessarily evidence-based, but um, it's supposed to be a short-term intervention and there are not really any studies out yet for long-term, but we have seen people on ketamine for several years already and they take sort of the once every other week dose um, so that's just the research is, is, is budding and it's coming out now. Go ahead. So I wanted to ask you, the people who stop taking the medication and start with the microdosing and then they would just definitely go back to the hospital and start from scratch, mm. I suppose, and my question to you is, these people who decided on their own, they didn't have any supervision or any, they, they were in a process of psychotherapy, so I give you an example of a patient that I saw who got much better with ECT and I saw him for CBT for cognitive behavior therapy for a year, year and a half. And he discussed the psilocybin. He wanted to use psilocybin. And our psychiatrists were like, no, this is too early. We don't have data. We cannot recommend it. It's not approved by the APA for depression. It's not something we can prescribe to you. I mean, they could as physicians prescribe it theoretically, but they didn't ethically feel comfortable because the science base wasn't there yet. And um, he decided he's just going to find a way to do it. And so he stopped his antidepressants because the provider that he found in the black market decided this, this is more effective if you stop your other meds. So he also, I, I tried to talk him into sticking with his psychiatrist and, and talking this through and pros and cons, and he eventually fired me temporarily, took this medication, stopped his effects or, and after two or three weeks, he completely crashed. I got a call, we had him admitted to the hospital, and then it took several weeks for the new round of SECT and enough for him to get better again. He eventually got better again, but it was like months of losses, lost kind of good time. So this is anecdotal. Um, with ketamine, I have not seen a lot of self microdosing. We see it with all kinds of other meds too. I mean, ecstasy, all kinds of street drugs that have been available in, you know, not legally for decades that people are trying to use medically. And to be fair, the research was um, not allowed, at least in the US, um, between the 1990s, I believe, until very recently, because it was we had a no drug kind of policy. And so even the research on psychedelics was not supported. And so we haven't studied it. And so a lot of patients would say, well, you know, the pharma industry um, dictates what you study, so we're going to try our off-the-market kind of own experiments. And people with, um, with treatment-resistant depression are, they're desperate, right? I mean, they don't do this lightly. They just really um, try to find something, and the system has often failed them. So um, let me move through a few more slides. That um, psychotherapy, I will just say that for severe and treatment resistant depression. It is not typically the first thought that people have, but I will say that it should be included in the package at least. I don't think that somebody who's failed ECT and, and uh, trans, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation and, and VNS and other th um, very powerful interventions should just go back to psychotherapy and do nothing else. 
that is not likely going to do the trick, but it should be included in a package of treating somebody who's been depressed for a long time. Um, I'm just gonna say that we are hoping that for people practicing psychotherapy, they do this based on available research evidence, uh, based on their background and experience as a clinician and taking into account patient preferences. I will skip the list of psychotherapies for now, um, just to say that um, I'm, of course, biased because I practice CBT. It is also empirically supported. It has the most research base uh, to it. That doesn't mean that it's the only effective treatment, uh, but it tends to be fairly acceptable as a treatment, eff uh, efficacious, uh, efficacious and cost-effective compared to medications and neuromodulation, and uh, also has enduring effects and helps prevent relapse. You know what, I'm going to um, skip some slides on behavioral activation, which is something that is um, close to my heart, just to say that the basic idea of providing behavior therapies, of course, always to, um, to reverse the spiral that goes down to depression because we avoid things that could be rewarding and we avoid more and more of everything, um, which of course increases depression. This is the cycle we are trying to break and go in the other way. And so modern day behavioral act, uh, activation is not just a bringing you in contact with potentially rewarding uh, activities, but it's much more focused on the context, the environmentally context and uh, takes into account a person's values. And sometimes it's a little bit of an anti-anxiety treatment as well because um, people don't always just not engage in behaviors because they don't feel like it. Over time, when we've been chronically depressed for 30 years, it becomes also quite scary to start doing these things again. Um, so we are much more using the language now of purpose and of having meaningful activities in our life rather than going for just joy because it's um, been the more, it, it's sort of, uh, it speaks to more people when we can say, you know, what really do you want to be about? Because, I mean, let's face it, my job is not always fun, but it's highly rewarding to me and it's highly meaningful to me and I'm actually not going for the short-term pleasures very much. So telling me to uh, go to the movies would not get me out of depression, <laughs> right? So everybody is different and we wanna take that into account. So in the third wave of CBTs, I just wanted to emphasize that we um, integrate, as in the morning, there were a couple of talks about this uh, mindfulness and acceptance-based techniques sort of dis deciding we focus on what we can control, which is really only our behavior, and letting go what is not in our control. And then there's the whole group of psychosocial interventions. There's neuromodulation. I'm gonna skip the specifics. Um, I will just say a little bit about the RTMS. We talked, um, we heard a talk this morning um, from Dr. Duval about um, a research study so this is kind of what my clinic is, is doing research on more than anything, um, is using uh, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation in combination with other treatments to, um, to treat the depression. So let me just say um, the challenge with the treating TRD is that usually one form of treatment is not sufficient, usually we have failed the patients by not providing the appropriate intervention for them and they have treatment resistant depression. I think there's more, more awareness of that. It's really uh, the medical fee field that failed rather than the patient and that um, we actually caused sometimes some of this hopelessness. So we see a lot of uh, patients who come to us, A, it's like their last hope and B, they've, had, they've been told by many providers that they can't help them, that somehow they're not responding well to their great treatments. And so a lot of my patients 
have this like, what's the point? Just one more treatment's not going to work for me anyway, kind of attitude. And that with that comes the uh, fact that with each episode of depression, the odds of relapsing again grows. So the more chronic you are, the more chronic you will become. Um, and so what we really need is a rapid treatment that is also sustainable. And as you can see with these examples, they often don't go together with this one intervention and is tolerable. So this brings me to the interprofessional clinical practice, which is really just a collaborative practice defined by the WHO as, um, uh, as an innovative strategy playing an important role in mitigating the global health workforce crisis. It's um, IPE, interprofessional, um, no, interprofessional CP, so clinical practice, is when um, multiple health workers from different professional backgrounds work together with patients, families, and caretakers and communities to deliver the highest quality care. And so there are, there are a lot of, um, you know what, there are a lot of benefits, uh, direct and indirect benefits to the patient when we work together as a collaborative team effectively. Uh, patient outcomes tend to improve. Medication adherence can improve if I emphasize this in behavior therapy. Um, all kinds of patient factors we see improved. And of course, the most, I think the most salient benefit is that people tend to respond more quickly to a combined multimodal treatment, um, which has to kind of go together with interprofessional clinical practice because it's not just our um, next generation learners that need to learn how to work together but also us, current workforce, um, and it really kind of requires a cultural change and a, a, a buy-in from leadership and trainings to work well together interprofessional. Whoops. Uh, so I have a lot of different examples of what this can look like, but um, let me just jump to the barriers and then the summary slides. So, uh, we practice this in our clinic. I would say we're not quite at the interprofessional effective uh, care. We are at collaborative care, which is not the deepest level of professional integration. Um, we are still working on addressing the various barriers that we face. Most of them are related to time pressure of our providers and also resources are lacking so collaboration is not usually covered by insurance they just see they just pay when you see the patient for those minutes that you see the patient and so uh, money and time is really are the biggest barriers and there are very effective ways of addressing the barriers i'm happy to uh, provide more information on on these analyses um, but really interprofessional core competencies come down to understanding what everybody's roles and responsibilities are and addressing um, care in a value-driven and ethical manner. And then this is the biggest obstacle usually. It's teamwork and communication. There's a lot of room for improvement in our area because of hierarchies and conventions that are not conducive to interprofessional collaborative care. So I just organized a conference at our um, psychiatry department and invited somebody who is an expert on that. And so we, we have now a start, we have started to provide ongoing trainings for working better together as, as a team. So takeaways from this presentation are really that TRD is complex, it's an enormous disease burden, um, very diverse group of patients. Some might even say it's not the depression that they're really dealing with, it's often childhood trauma that needs to be addressed. Um, and so one single treatment is not likely to work, so we need to work together as a team. And I think we all work with teams and we all see patients who also see other providers. The key is to do this in a systematic, well-executed manner 
And that requires intentionality, planning, and constant feedback in order to overcome these barriers that, at least in the US, are very much related to resources and time constraints. So I know that's exactly what we have today is time constraints, and I will leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you.